wire? Okay. Can everybody hear me in the back all right? All right, I guess so. You guys got the good seats. I was told the other day that I have a face made for radio. So uh, so uh, thank you for coming to watch this. I'm presenting the work I'm currently working on for my uh, dissertation. And uh, I would just like to take a second and thank my uh, co-authors, Dr. Glenn Aiken, who you, some of you heard talk this morning at the Forge Quality Symposium, uh, Dr. Bill Witt at UK Weed Science, and uh, Pat Birch and Byron Slew from Dow AgroSciences. So I'd like to just begin just talking a little bit about, about, about tall fescue and uh, fescue toxicosis. As most of you know in this room that tall fescue is a uh, cool season, is a dominant, cool, dominant species in cool season pastures. Uh, it, it, it also contains a fungal endophyte which produces ergot, ergot alkaloids which has been shown to uh, be responsible for the symptoms of fescue toxicosis. This, our alkaloids are the highest within the seed heads and as Dr. Aiken illustrated too, it makes them very important to control because the animals will graze them. Uh, currently, the, the current maintenance strategies for toxicosis are twofold or either aimed at pre either preventing the production of alkaloids through the use of novel endophytes or endophyte feed varieties or through limiting the intake of the alkaloids by grazing animals such as dilution with grain and legumes or reducing the number of seed heads either through heavy grazing, mowing, or more recently, as a, more recently as a chemical suppression. Uh, so, in a preliminary study that preceded this one, I, uh, it was conducted over two years at the University of Kentucky. Many of you heard Dr. Aiken kind of hit on it this morning. Was that um, the chaparral herbicide, which contains metsulfuron, was used in a stalker operation to suppress the reproductive growth of tall fescue. And it showed that it has some value to, potential value to beef operations. There's improved forage quality, particularly in the water soluble carbohydrates and protein, and also better animal gains. There was also less, uh, a reduction in the severity of the symptoms of toxicosis. There wasn't a complete inhibition of it, just a reduction of the severity. Also, there was a yield reduction, as Dr. Aiken pointed out. Uh, the majority of this yield reduction was due to the loss of stem, stemming material. Also, a relatively light stocking rate was used within the study, just one at 1.1 series per acre. So what the objective of this study was to just kind of continue at and see how these trends are carried out over uh, two, different, different, two different grazing pressures. More importantly, we want to know how some of these other attributes of pasture productivity might be affected. For example, how will carrying capacity be affected by the uh, reduction in forage yield? So th this research was conducted this past summer at the University of Kentucky, the C. Orrin Little Research Farm near Versailles. The on end fight con infected Kentucky 31 that was established during the spring of 2010. There were two and a half acre pastures arranged as a randomized complete block with three replications. We had four treatments. We had two herbicide treatments with or without chaparral, and each of those were grazed under two different grazing intensities, a low and moderate. We tried to maintain a seasonal average of about 3,000 pounds of forage per acre on the low grazing intensity and about 2,300 pounds of forage on the moderate grazing intensity. Chaparral was applied at two ounces per acre about the last week of March. Um, as I said, we were, one, we were interested in the carrying, the carrying capacity, so we used a variable stocking rate. For those of you who aren't familiar with the variable stocking rate, we had three animals that stayed on there the whole time, they, we termed these as the testers. Those were used to uh, measure the average daily gain. And we also, throughout the season, added and take, we added animals to the pastures and took them off depending on the amount of uh, forage available. You can see this year, it was, we got started a little gra grazing a lot later than we wanted to, which will come to play here in a second, but we still were able to get 74 days of grazing. Uh, we gained May 5th and extended to July 14th. The average daily gains of the steers were, collect, were collected from the tester animals based on shrunk weights uh, collected at the initiation, initiation and termination of the study. The carrying capacity, as I failed to mention down here, was estimated we kept track of the number of days there were steers on there. So what I'm presenting is the actual number of steer days per acre. 
and we got game per acre for each of the individual reps by multiplying the average daily game by carrying capacity. Also, every two weeks, we es estimated forage availability using a rising disc meter or following disc meter, and we took quality samples to estimate crude protein, water soluble carbohydrate, uh, digestibility, and ash. And at the end of the study, we also ultrasounded the animals to give us some kind of estimate of body condition. And so you can kind of see these pastures here. You can see where these animals right here, this greener area, is the treated pastures. You can see this real uh, stemmy area. This was taken in uh, mid-June, so we had a lot of reproductive growth. You can see it better down here. This is along the fence line between a, a low grazing intensity untreated and a low grazing intensity uh, treated with chaparral. And you can see the number of seed heads. I believe on average there's about 60 seed heads per square meter and the treated versus three per square meter. So about a 20 fold reduction. Um, and that was taken at mid June. So seasonal for forage availabilities. Um, you can see on our, our uh, low grazing intensity, the untreated, we're pretty close to meeting our seasonal average. On the moderate, on the untreated pastures, you can see a little high. Part of that was when we turned the animals in late, we didn't turn them into the uh, early May. We had a lot of growth in there. It took us a while to get that down. And when we got it down, they tended to graze off the seed heads and leave the stubble. So these values are a little bit inflated. With the chaparral pastures, we only had two rub kits. We had a heavy thatch uh, from the previous summer and the fall. And what happened was it got matted down and actually suppressed or reduced some of the fescue emergence. So we had encroachment of crabgrass during the season. So we had to uh, throw at least one rub kit of each of the chaparral grazing intensities out. So these values presented here are the, are the average of two reps. We, um, the moderate one you can see here, we didn't do is, it's kind of misleading because we're, there's no significant difference. And part of that was we had one, one rep that was overly productive. No matter, we, it was, no matter how many animals we put on it, it kept putting out grass. So that's a little bit inflated too. But even though there wasn't a significant difference, we did have a tendency for a difference in average daily gain. Usually average daily gain tends to decrease with increased grazing pressure, and we did see a tendency of it. It wasn't significant, it was a p-value of 0.14. Um, but we still had a tendency to indicate that we did, we did have differences in grazing pressure despite the lack of uh, difference in yield. Nutritive value, this is pretty similar to what Dr. Aiken was talking about this morning. Grazing intensity did not have an effect, but the chaparral treatment did. You see in vitro, digest the dry matter was increased 10%, crude protein 15%. Uh, there's only a tendency for the uh, water soluble carbohydrate, water soluble carbohydrate to be better or higher. Uh, I, one of the reasons too, I think we had such a wet year, we had a lot of growth coming on too. So if we had your typical year, I believe the difference would be a lot larger. Uh, and also ash content was higher. And again, from what we all learned at the Forge Quality Symposium, this, the, better, the greater nutritive value was due to the uh, presence of less stem material. So each of the main effects, the grazing intensity and the chaparral tre treatment had an effect, but there was no interaction. So what I'm going to present the next two slides is the, uh, the effects of the main, the main effects. So grazing intensity, you can see, as you would expect, this is the ASR, the average stocking rate throughout the season. And as you would expect on their moderate grazing the higher grazing intensity, the moderate one, the average stocking rate was higher. There was also a uh, higher carrying capacity. We had about 37 greater days per acre with the moderate grazing intensity. And the average daily gain was higher, as you would expect. And there was no difference in gain, total gain per acre. With the chaparral treatment, you can see here, the uh, use of chaparral significantly lowered the average stocking rate from two animals per two steers per acre to about 1.4. There was about 50 less days of grazing, but you can see here that the average daily gain was much higher, and again there was no difference in average daily gain. And you can really walking out in these pastures, you can really notice the difference. You can see here 
this is one of the tester animals from the treated pastures. You can see how sleek. You can see this animal has a little more finish on them. And same with this pet. This steer is real sleek. This is another tester within the chaparral treated pastures. And you compare that to one of the testers on the untreated. You can see all the stems. This is the untreated. You can see it's still not what we would probably consider a rough hair coat, but maybe somewhat transitional, but definitely rougher. And you can see the animal does not have as much finish on them. And we saw that within the ultrasounds. You can see this first column is the ribeye area. Uh, you can see that the chaparral treatment had about one square inch greater ribeye area. Uh, back fat, we had a tendency, it was still, back fat and run fat were also greater chaparral treatment. The grazing intensity did not have an effect on these, the ultrasound measures, body condition. So in summary, based on one year of study, um, this is just one year of data we're continuous on, we need to continue this. The chaparral tended to improve steer performance as measured by uh, carcass quality traits and an uh, average daily gain, and this came down because of forage nutritive value. The uh, large increase in average daily gain you saw from the application of chaparral helped offset the uh, reduction in the carrying capacity. And you can see from the, the two slides comparing that this low grazing intensity produced similar results to the use of chaparral. However, as you continue this out throughout the season, you're, you're stuck with uh, more mature, unpalatable forage, lowers the intake, and your animal, animal performance is also likely to decrease. And we're still on, I unfortunately don't have any data to present on the toxicosis, the ergovaline, or any of the factors of toxicosis. We're still, we had, we had, we got some of that in, we had some back to get analyzed, so we're not quite uh, ready to talk about that. So. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge a few people. Tracy Hamilton, may know Tracy. This, none of this will be able to be done without him. He's uh, becoming, a, I I'm starting to realize now how valuable a, a good technician is. So don't tell Tracy I said that. But um, also my fellow graduate student, Jessica Bussard, Dow AgriSciences for supporting the uh, fund, providing the funding, and also the faculty and staff at the ARS unit in Lexington and the Department of Plant and Soil Science. So with that, I'll take any questions. If you couldn't hear the question, the, uh, the question was, do you think some of the increase in average daily gain we saw was due to uh, the growth of bluegrass, as Dr. Aiken mentioned in the Forge Quality Symposium, that in the preliminary study we had an encroachment of bluegrass. Within this one, we really didn't have that much bluegrass within the pastures, but I think it was about 10%, which is probably about, actually probably a little less than average for what we see in Kentucky. So. What about uh, Well, we did. Um, there's really two, two pastures we had a Christian crabgrass and we threw those replicates out. The other ones, there really wasn't a whole lot of crabgrass in there. There's some, probably less than 5%, less than 2%. So. All right. Yeah. Uh, uh, you mean uh, botanical, botanical composition or... Oh, now the question was if we took any kind of stand density on a uh, tall fescue and we didn't, and you know, I really probably you wouldn't, that would be something you see over multiple years. I don't think you would necessarily see the rolling grazing season, but I may be wrong. But no, we didn't take any kind of measures of it.